We are uh, taking you live from uh, Beijing, China. Today we have Ambassador Jose Santiago Santa Romana. Good morning, sir. Also known as <laughs> Chito Santa Romana. <laughs> Ambassador. Yeah, okay. um, Do you have any statement? Okay. Well, I just want to greet everyone. It's nice to see you again. It's only been a few months since I last saw you. I didn't expect to see you so soon, but you're most welcome. As you know, this visit started with the president's interest of showing his support for the basketball, for the Philippine basketball team. But it has now become a high stakes uh, diplomatic engagement. And uh, today is the big day, specifically tonight, when we have the, the summit meeting between President Duterte and President Xi Jinping. Uh, I just want to say a few words. Uh, I think the President has made it clear that from his point of view, the time has come. Uh, I think the first three years, he has exerted a lot of the diplomatic capital to build a reservoir of goodwill and friendship with President Xi. They have met at least seven times. This is the eighth meeting. And also because he has only three years to go. And so he has decided that it's time to include in the diplomatic agenda and in the discussions sensitive issues that may have caused misunderstanding if it were brought up in the past. One is, of course, the arbitration award. The president actually has mentioned it in several discussions with Xi in the past, but not in a direct or honest discussion as an exchange of views on the subject. So this is an opportunity. We have no illusion that uh, we can solve the issue overnight. I think the important thing is to bring it to the fore of the diplomatic agenda. However, as the saying goes, the disputes do not define the entirety of, or the totality of the bilateral relations. So aside from areas of difference, we will, of course, have on the agenda possible areas of cooperation. And one in particular is the question of the oil and gas cooperation. Another one, of course, is the whole issue of the code of conduct on the South China Sea. In addition, the agenda will include, you know, areas of economic cooperation, a review of the different projects, areas for more cooperation in the economic, in the infrastructure area. So we have uh, the economic, members of the economic team here, as well as members of the security cluster. Uh, of course, in one seating, we don't expect to solve everything, but at least with the two heads of state meeting and hopefully reaching a higher level of consensus, we can push forward uh, different areas. I think the president is very much interested to move forward on the MOU on oil and gas cooperation that was signed last November. Uh, and I think the MOU provides a roadmap for moving forward. In the past two months, last June, the Philippine side submitted its proposed terms of reference to the Chinese side, and the Chinese side agreed to it and submitted their letters, their notes of agreement last July. So that has already been agreed upon. Now the question is how to move forward further. Uh, and it's possible the two sides will discuss you know, the need to form now the Joint Steering Committee and the Working Committees, the 
entrepreneur, joint entrepreneurial working committees, meaning composed of the companies that will actually be engaged in the cooperation. So that is an overview of how the situation will go. Um, you know, generally when you have two heads of state meeting, they don't deal with the nitty gritty. That will be done at the working level, but they will at least come to some agreement on the general points, on a consensus that will then be provide the impetus for the working groups on both sides to continue and work on the details. As the saying goes, the devil is in the details, but at least, you know, if there is this consensus at the top level, it will help to push the process forward. Okay? With, with that as an introduction, uh, if I may add one thing, the basic approach we follow in terms of Philippines-China relations is to recognize that there are areas of difference and there are fundamental differences with respect to sovereignty, with respect to sovereign rights, with respect to the view on the arbitral award, but they don't constitute the totality of the relations. And that is why the other aspect is that there are areas of cooperation. And as we have shown in the past three years, we have moved, we have fast forwarded areas of cooperation, trade, tourism, investments, infrastructure, education, cultures, science and technology, and there are more that will be signed tonight. So if you view it as a unity of opposites, that there are two sides, in the relations, the differences and the areas where there are no differences, then the basic approach is to manage the differences peacefully, diplomatically, through high-level summits, through the bilateral consultative mechanism, and to move forward on the areas of cooperation so as to propel forward and to maintain the positive trajectory of Philippines-China relations. I'm open. So any questions? First question. <coughs> Sir, yung medyo recent lang, yung pung apology ng Chinese uh, okay. fishermen. Uh, do we consider it as a, an act of the Chinese government or just a personal act on behalf of the fishermen? And if it is a Chinese action, what is its implication on maybe uh, the relationship of the of, of, of our countries? Actually, the issuance of the public apology by the ship owner is a welcome development. It helps clear the air for the bilateral talks that will happen tonight. But for your background, what we've gone through is really separate but parallel investigations as the plan was. And then we exchanged results and we found out that we basically agreed on the key points of what happened. So as far back as late June, early July, during a meeting of the Joint Commission on Agriculture and Fisheries between the Chinese government, the Philippine government, it was held in Beijing, the fisheries official of China already expressed a verbal apology and, ex and gave us a verbal report, which we have transmitted to the authorities. But it was clear to us that not only from the president, but also from the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, he made it clear what we want is a public formal apology, written, not verbal. And that's what took a bit of time. It was the result of intense negotiations between our DFA, our embassy, and the Chinese foreign ministry and the Chinese embassy. And it took a, a lot, of, uh, several rounds. Uh, and I guess, to a certain extent, the visit provided an impetus because we were telling them that unless this is cleared, then it will come up in the discussion. I mean, it could still come up, but at least now, uh, on, on a positive note, it's really how to avoid for the future 
and in a sense we have we're near if or we're on the cusp of a closure I mean there's still the compensation issue but generally speaking I think we have made the breakthrough this apology of course represents the ship owner but in a sense I think through diplomatic discussions with the Chinese side we have made it clear that this had a negative impact had an adverse impact on the bilateral relations particularly on China's image and that one way to correct this was through what you've seen, the public explanation, the investigation, and the apology. So we welcome this development. From the point of view, of course, of the Philippines, from the very beginning, we took note of it because we wanted to know more. <laughs> and up to yesterday, that was the position that the DF DFA took, that we took note of it. It does, as, as others have pointed out, of course, it doesn't mean that we accept, you know, Nansha or that the Reed Bank is part of, of Nansha or the Spratlys. That is a separate issue. And that, and that is a whole separate discussion altogether. But on the issue of the fishing boat incident, I think it's settled in terms of being a, it was not a ramming incident. It was an accident. The Chinese provided their explanation. They didn't see, you know, at, the, at, at that night. There are other details uh, that they provided. But uh, the point is, the, key, the highlights were as released yesterday. So the implications, I think it helps to clear the air. It helps to, as, as the reaction in the Philippines showed that uh, It's never easy uh, to make a public apology, but in this case, as, as Secretary Panello has said, it was an act of humility. And of course, we take it as it is. So just one last on the subject, why did we want a public apology from the Chinese? Because I didn't, what we didn't want was, you know, they'd tell me I'm sorry, and I'll be the one to tell the Filipino people, well, he said I'm sorry. We wanted them to explain to the Filipino people. And that, I think that's why we wanted something not in the name of DFA, or not in the name of uh, the result of discussion, but something that, and, and it was supposed to be between two fishing boats, so it was very necessary. The, the, to, to be fair, to the Chinese side, the, there was a request from the Chinese side. They would send a delegation to visit the fishermen. Oh, yeah. Yes. But at that point, the atmosphere was just not too favorable. And, and we thought we had to clear. If, if they were to go now, it, we Are could consider it. Uh, we, we haven't had any further discussions <laughs> on the matter. <laughs> the subject, sir. Uh, Ambassador, follow up. Uh, any update on the compensation for the fishermen and what will be the system for the giving of compensation? Well, this is a matter that will still be subject to more studies and more discussion, more negotiations, actually. But again, just for your background, the Chinese did express their willingness to compensate very early on, but again, verbally. But we knew compensation was probably the least of the issues given China's standard of living and their economy. It was really the issue of the apology and the responsibility. They, they, even the, the accepting the major responsibility, that was pretty early on, on a verbal basis. And so, but we wanted you know, to clear the air. On, on the compensation, this is a matter that will have to be studied because they're procedural, but we'll probably uh, proceed and try to help out uh, the fishermen and the boat owner in the Philippines. And the question is how to quantify all this. So you obviously need uh, expert advice. And so this is something the other department agencies concerned will have to deal with and help the fishermen. BIFAR will also play a role and possibly DOJ. 
Sir, with uh, the Philippine government accepting the apology of the um, ship owner, does that mean that the Philippine government will no longer seek accountability with the fact that the uh, the, the Chinese side abandoned the Filipinos in the middle of the sea? They did provide an explanation for the abandonment that they didn't mean to abandon. Uh, there are additional details like they they knew the sh they heard the shouts for help but they couldn't understand the language and they were overcome by fear. And, and, and then that they reported instead to the fishing authorities of China uh, that what happened as they were leaving. It does not excuse them for the responsibility. The, the responsibility includes, includes that, by the way, uh, the, 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 the fact that they did not rescue our fishermen. And it is something that's a, a subject for further discussion in the sense that how do we avoid this in the future? Maybe they should have reported to our fishing authorities or, or to all, a, a body that will notify all the littoral countries. Uh, I think if they knew they were Filipinos, maybe it would have been a different story. So will we, will we still expect efforts from the government to make them accountable for what happened? Oh, it's an ongoing discussion, but uh, you see what what was released was uh, the general statement. There is a detailed report, but, but it's, again, we have to compare results. And uh, I think they have accepted that it was a mistake to also abandon. Uh, but it, I think what they were, what is not clear is, or rather in the future, that we want that to be avoided and it should not happen again. Sir, who will be paying for the damages? Will it be the Chinese government? Oh, it was or written the by the insurance. It's a mutual insurance company. So they make a distinction between their government and the provincial and, and the fishing boat. You know, that it's not, in other words, it's not directly owned in the sense that, but you know, in China, there are a lot of levels of state-owned government at the central level, the provincial level. It's a little complicated in this case, but uh, we'll know more at this point. But the letter was written by the Guangdong Provincial Fishery Mutual Insurance Association, which is like uh, you know the different fishing companies. They put together a fund for insurance purposes to cover you know, accidents and, and the like. Good morning, sir. Uh, sir, the, the apology issued by the uh, Fishermen's uh, Association does not bind the Chinese government. And corollary to that, uh, is there a need for the Chinese government to make its own ap apology to the <laughs> actions of their uh, fishermen? Were you going to go to a long discussion on this one? Um, I think the fact that the foreign ministry was deeply involved in these discussions with us, the moral responsibility, I think, they share. But the specific responsibility is that of the fishing boat. In other words, they actually facilitated the investigation and the uh, exchange of results. So they, the Chinese government cooperated. Is there a need for the Chinese government to issue a separate apology? Actually, the, sep the Chinese government through the foreign ministry has expressed they're sorry, they're very sorry about the incident through diplomatic channels already. Okay. Sir, uh, should this uh, settle the issue or the concern of some of our lawmakers that the uh, Fishing boat, which uh, in which was involved in the in incident, is a militia fishing boat. Uh, oh, the, the, I should tell you for background. We've also been told through diplomatic channels it's not a mem it's not a part of the maritime militia. Not. 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 Okay, so, uh, through the diplomatic channels. 
Sir, just a follow-up to Pia's question a while ago. We accepted their apology. They offered compensation. But will we or the Chinese government impose specific sanction to this Chinese fisherman? Sir? It's a subject of further discussion. And sir, um, can you please address the issue of somehow questionable timing of the issuance of the written apology, considering that now or the president is here in China? Sir. No, I think it's the result of intense diplomatic efforts on both sides. Uh, when when there, there were discussions on the agenda, I think uh, it was quite clear, we made it quite clear that the, the president wanted to discuss a range of issues in the West Philippine Sea, the South China Sea. And of course, this is one of the issues. And, and as a result of that, you know, there was a discussion, you know, they were, we were saying that we, we didn't consider this resolved yet or closed yet, that it can be raised. And they were asking why. Well, because we don't, we don't have the public apology. We have the f verbal, but it would help for, to clear the air, to improve China's own standing in the Philippines, and it would also improve the atmosphere for the discussions. And I think that is what has been achieved. But they could have um, issued the written apology two months ago. As I said, they, what they did was the verbal apology, but uh, we didn't think that was enough. Or we thought it was necessary for the Chinese boat owner to explain it himself. Not to me, not through DFA, not through the media, but through directly to the public. And that's why there was this letter. Morning, Ambassador. Uh, it somehow related to Ms. Chen's question. Did <coughs> the Philippine government see any criminal act committed by those fishermen involved in that incident? Well, that's a complicated legal issue. As you know, the DFA issued a protest immediately as it happened. We called for a, an apology. We called for investigation. We called for p penalties. If, if the investigation showed that there were criminal uh, responsibility. You see, it happened in under international law, this was committed by a Chinese boat, okay? And they went back to China. So the investigation is done by the Chinese authorities. So you basically do it through diplomatic negotiations. If we had captured, if we had detained them, that's a separate story. But can we say categorically that they are not yet uh, off the hook, uh, Ambassador? Um, I have to consult my legal advisors on this issue. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dana Marare. Uh, um, Marlon. Microphone. In connection to Henry's question. Uh, on the part of the Philippine government, is it uh, an admission of uh, guilt? on the part of the uh, Chinese fishermen, this issuance of uh, formal... Well, they accepted responsibility. As to the new ones, whether it, you know, you go into legal niceties here, I, I'd rather stick to what they said. They accepted the major share of the responsibility. So, uh, Ambassador, and you, you also mentioned uh, a joint report uh, a joint investigation. There's no, there's no joint. So there's no, there's no separate. A separate separate investigation. We, uh, is there a formal uh, report or even a summary of the investigation on this incident? Yes, we have a copy. Uh, are you willing to <laughs> make that copy? Uh, this is this, uh, this is right now. Uh, this is uh, to be determined by by the foreign secretary and the DFA. Thank you, Ambassador, um, with the South China Morning Post. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit more about the joint oil and gas yes. uh, cooperation. So could you talk a bit more about that, like the racial and also is it going to cover the disputed area? How is it going to? Well, well, right now we're in the early stage, so it's difficult to answer you for sure. Uh, but what? The, the, basically, I'd, I'd ask you to go back to the MOU because it lays it out. It's the, it's the roadmap. We want to achieve um, 
cooperation in joint exploration in areas in the West Philippine Sea, South China Sea, uh, both disputed and undisputed, because the question is who disputes what? So it's, this is, from our point of view, that from the Philippine point of view, undisputed, as from the Philippine point of view, disputed. The Chinese accept certain areas are undisputed, so that shouldn't be a problem. Basically, what, we, what is the situation now is that there is a moratorium. So there's no, it put a stop to oil exploration and development. So I think the, the plan is you know, to get the framework ready so that the steering committee can start the ball rolling and as well as the work groups and they can start meeting and uh, so that the service contracts which have been affected by the moratorium can also proceed. You know, they've been put on hold. So there's a lot to do. The problem is we'll take it one step at a time, okay? And uh, it's difficult to outline all the answers to all the questions. Some of the questions may have to be resolved through negotiations, uh, through the companies themselves. Uh, and hopefully the end of this is like a commercial contract. That is what we look forward to. But from the point of view of the Philippines, of course, there are certain constraints. The Philippine Constitution, UNCLOS. Uh, but if, if you look at the MOU, there is a statement there that on the one hand, we follow the spirit of the UN Charter, UNCLOS, international law. On the other hand, both sides will proceed without giving up their positions, their legal positions on certain issues. So we're trying to find a way within certain parameters to move forward. And so far, it would, it would take a lot of flexibility and pragmatism on both sides. And so a lot of this will be through discussions, negotiations, and consultations. So you have a story to cover in the next couple of months as the story unfolds. I cannot tell you the conclusion, but there is a hope that we move forward and hopefully, because it's very important for the Philippines, the basic issue here, if you look at the big picture, is really one of energy security. Malampaya is running dry and it's going to affect our power supply. So that's why the president is moving with a sense of urgency to move the process forward especially in these last three years. And so we hope to get it going as fast as possible, but it would take, it takes two to tango, as they say, so in this case, you need to work together uh, and cooperate, hopefully find areas of cooperation with the Chinese side. Kat, yeah. Good morning, Your Excellency. My name is Isabel De Leon of Manila Bulletin. Uh, may we get details of the six government-to-government -government, uh, agreements that will be signed and the other agreements that you that will be signed today or well, later tonight? Well, you know, nothing is signed until it's signed. Yeah, so I think the proper time is afterwards. After. You'll, be, you'll be told. But generally, uh, what I know right now is it has to do with uh, higher education, science and technology, um, I think there is something also on infrastructure cooperation and uh, other forms of economic cooperation. But I don't have the actual six and the details. And also because we'll, after, after it's done, you know, and we're sure. Because in the past, sometimes, the last minute, there have been changes. Uh, so when it's done, uh, at the proper time, it will be released. I mean, as, you, as you've seen last November, sometimes it takes a couple of days, but eventually they'll be released. And, and you can also keep asking for them from the lead agencies concerned. Because the ones who sign, you'll, you'll know it will be announced. They're the, their departments are the ones concerned, so they will be the ones to explain in more detail. My role is diplomacy. <laughs> I'm not the whole government, <laughs> but I, I, I can tell you the overall uh, situation. Good morning, Ambassador. Christina Pastor, the Philam. Um, were you at all surprised that uh, the Chinese government 
agreed to a meeting where the agenda would be, would include the West Philippine Sea and the Hague ruling and the Chinese fishermen. For the longest time, they have not, they have avoided talking about these matters with us. All of a sudden now there is this openness. How do you explain that, sir? <laughs> well, I think, as I, as I said earlier, I think the Chinese side and, and the president has explained it. He's not coming here to impose it on China. He's not coming here to provoke uh, the Chinese. He's coming here to exchange views, to understand where the differences lie, and to, ha to have a deeper understanding and to see where there are areas where the gaps can be bridged. It's, he's here to build bridges, not to burn bridges with China. So I think the Chinese side has been reassured that it's within the framework of the Philippines continuing a friendly and cooperative relationship and that it will be a friendly and anus discussion. And that they have met so many times, I think they have reached quite a high level of rapport, that they have become, you know, uh, good friends. So when you're friends, there's nothing you cannot discuss with each other. And even though the differences may be quite fundamental. Still, you have to understand why the reaction is such, or why, why we took this position and why the Chinese took this position. Because sometimes we know why we took our position, but it's difficult to understand the other side. So it is, in a sense, trying to understand the Chinese position while explaining our own position. I don't expect that, you know, it's 500 pages, that you read the 500 pages to each other, no. I think what this is, the, basically this is the beginning of a long dialogue. As the saying goes, when you have a long journey, the first step is very important. And so we're taking this first step. And subsequently, it will probably be at the working level, the bilateral consultative mechanism, the foreign ministry, political consultations. There are other channels, as well as continuing efforts on think tanks on both sides to understand each other's position. Because there are actually very deep legal issues involved here on both sides. It's not quite so simple, you know, why international law cannot be enforced, why, why we sought this, what happened. I mean, in other words, I think the Chinese know the president too. A President Xi, I think, is a good measure of the president. So I think he expects an honest discussion, direct, but friendly, in a friendly and cordial atmosphere. So I think in, th in that context, it's not going to be a shouting match. It's going to be a very civil and diplomatic discussion. Any more questions? Last two. <coughs> Joseph and then Ace. 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 Ambassador, uh, what are the chances that uh, President Duterte and she will discuss the Pogo issue? What are the chances? I think, I think the President is prepared if the Chinese would raise it. The Chinese have already expressed their position publicly, quite publicly. So whether they'll raise it or not is, we'll see. But the, the President's position, I think, as Secretary Panello has already explained to you, th there are differences. And there are, again, simil uh, areas of cooperation. Mm. About two weeks ago, there was a PNP group here, the anti-kidnapping group, that met with their counterparts on how to strengthen law enforcement, cooperation in law enforcement in cracking down on the criminal elements that have been kidnapping Chinese in the Philippines. And of course, some of them are related to online gambling. A lot of them are related to online gambling. But it's not only Chinese syndicates. There are some Filipino criminal elements, guns for hire in the Philippines, that are working together with them. So. Both are interested to crack down on this. So that's an area of commonality. Where the difference is is that in China, 
gambling, whether online, offline, whatever, is illegal. In the Philippines, it is legal. So it's possible when the Chinese crack down on the websites here that there will a, a part of the market, a big, a big portion, or at least half of it, or at most half of it, supposedly half of the market is mainland China, will be affected because with all the announcements made, I think it's meant also to signal to the mainlanders that you know you, this is not acceptable. Uh, and the Chinese have, and, and the Filipinos have already cooperated. I think there was one reported uh, AF cooperation. They started actually with some Chinese who had online websites, but this one was engaged in pornographic sites. And they, they, they were brought back to the, the Chinese citizens were brought back here with the help of the uh, PNP. So, so I think we're, we're ready if, if the discussion is on it. And I think the Philippines right now is already taking steps to regulate, you know. Originally, the Philippine concern was, you know, the influx of Chinese tourists who became employees because, you know, we, don't, we hardly provide work visas here of China, only for a DV, you know, very few. It takes time. So they, you, there is a syndicate that organized this, you know, they would bring them, uh, make them join tour groups, and then while there, they convert the visas to work permits, which on the visa that we issued, it's not allowed. But apparently there is some government agencies can do it. So there are some leakages that we're trying to plug, and hopefully to tax them, to regulate them, and to bring it to a reasonable level, because the increase was just too much, you know, and uh, it was a concern early on for us. The Chinese concern came with the spate of killings and kidnappings, and a lot of Chinese families were complaining to the government, so they've taken the cudgels. Ambassador, you said, uh President Duterte is prepared in case uh, yes. his counterpart uh, brings up the request to ban online well, gambling. the president has been prepared for all sorts of okay. issues. Yeah. So how will he respond in the event that President Xi brings up that request <laughs> that please ban illegal <laughs> or ban online gambling? Panelo already told you yesterday that he'll say it's legal in the Philippines. So we will reject. No, that's not rejecting. It's explaining, <laughs> <laughs> explaining the difference. No, we can't. They can't dictate on okay. us. That's our sovereign decision. Okay. So that's that. That is where we stand. Mm. Okay. To be, more to be more diplomatic, we will make. We will keep we'll it. Explain our we position. will keep it legal, uh, unless the president decides otherwise, because this is uh, <laughs> an office, this is under, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. a presidential, mm -hmm. what's it, an executive? I, I'm not clear on all the legal details, but I leave it to our, our experts to deal with this. Uh, for me, I think the key is for the president to be ready to explain, you know, and it will have an economic impact on us. Yeah. yeah. So yes. if we are to do it, we want a soft landing. Mm. We don't want uh, a drastic, you know, impact that will be adversely our, affect our economy. As a matter of fact, we're already trying it. We're trying to regulate, to tighten the screws, so to speak, and to monitor. Uh, I mean, all these efforts, you know, the creation of the hubs, uh, issuance of tax information, uh, TINs, all of this is meant to keep it within bounds. And then with the Chinese now taking their position, it's possible the business will, will now have to downsize to an appropriate level uh, that will be supported by the market that is available. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Po. Last question, Joseph? Last question, question, sorry. <laughs> 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 sure. uh, we're interested lang to know if there's going to be a one-on-one, uh, -on -one, a four eyes meeting between the president and President Xi who fits in the schedule. <laughs> or you're not free to say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll just report on what happens after. I think the president is re ready for all possibilities. Uh, the key is for him to communicate what he wants to tell President Xi. But you know, 
I participated in these discussions. I mean, it's, it's usually an exchange of views. You, you say your piece, I say my piece, and so on. And then, and then time, you know, time is limited. You, can't, you can discuss an issue all in all if you want, but then they, they try to summarize their points. And then you, ag you agree on areas of cooperation where you don't agree, you agree to disagree or discuss it again at a future opportunity. In other words, things that cannot be resolved right away, then you try to take it up at the next opportunity. So as to whether it will be four eyes, eight eyes, or more eyes, <laughs> there will certainly be the bilateral, you know, that we'll have. And sometimes they, there's a smaller group that meets uh, afterwards on, on directly relevant issues. But we'll reserve that for a future opportunity. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not the one explaining it. <laughs> but uh, so, so, so just so you know how uh, the diplomatic uh, meeting is done. So another concern in the Philippines are the, um, in the Mesir incursions, but the passage of uh, Chinese warships yeah, yeah, in yeah. territorial waters. Is this yeah. on the table? And, no, uh, no, this, is, this again is a matter of, uh, has been a matter of diplomatic discussion. As you know, the Philippines has already filed a diplomatic note, note verbal. Well, you can call it a protest note, but it's really asking for a clarification on why, where did you come from? Why did you have your AIS turned off? Or, you know, what are you doing in our waters? The Chinese position, by the way, is, uh, and I shouldn't explain it for them, but this is what they told us. Uh, but you can find it also in their websites, either, the, because the, it was asked at the foreign ministry briefing. Uh, my recollection is that they say it's an innocent passage, no hostile intent. Uh, and they say if there are any concerns on the part of the Philippines, we can discuss it through diplomatic channels and, uh, and also between military to military so as to clear the air. So I think, um, again, it's, uh, if it's done through consultation, I think we can clear the air. At this point, sir, if they're saying it's innocent passage, yeah. um, we're fine with it. I mean... For us, mm. you know, as the saying goes in diplomacy, trust but verify. You take them on their word, but you observe what happens. And then you, you make a determination. So it's good. We exchange views. You have to combine diplomacy with deterrence. You have to combine negotiation with validating you know, what's been said. Uh, there's no magic formula, but those are the basic approaches we follow. But we would require them in the future to still um, inform us because the president has issued an order that all foreign sh vessels should Well, FII that's the, the call to all, yeah. a call to all. Uh, and, and this is a matter, again, for, for the maritime experts, the legal experts, to deal with because it seems there is a need for an archipelagic passage bill because under the law, if you don't have that, then they will pass through what is, was done in the past. And apparently these passageways were open to commercial traffic as well as warships in the past. So the question really is, was there any hostile intent? Uh, what were they doing there? And, uh, and the Chinese have shown a willingness to consider our concerns. Sir, sir, are you aware if uh, China has already made a formal request for the Philippines? Sorry? As, uh, are you aware if there's already a formal request from the Chinese government for the Philippine government to ban all pogos and all kinds of uh, online gambling catering to they Chinese? They said it openly. But form a formal request? A formal, not of course, through your office. Through me, or? not through me. No, it's open. It's, it's public. Mm. I mean, they don't have to go through me. Mm. They, they said it publicly. They called for an end. There was a statement. Already yes, of the foreign ministry. Uh, yeah, the foreign ministry. Mm. But in terms of so procedure, they don't have yeah. to file anything. They could, but uh, in this case, they took a open position. That is why. That's why you have to explain each other's position. I mean, we we'd like to know, you know, I, we understand their concerns, and why they would like it. But we have our own concerns. That's why we cannot do it at this point. 
So, so, and why it's legal in the Philippines. So go ahead with the mainland, mainlanders, you know. The area under their jurisdiction, we have our own jurisdiction. If, if, if it's not to the mainland, but to Hong Kong, I mean to, I mean it's part of China, but it's <laughs> separate, this territory right now is the Hong Kong and Taiwan or the Chinese diaspora around the world. That's a separate issue. And Philippine, I mean, Filipinos I don't think are involved in this, but it's mainly a foreign market. Mm. So I, I don't understand what the question is. Have they made any formal yeah. complaint? Not to me. Mm -hmm. uh, they have openly said it in their foreign ministry statement, so that's more of their expressing their public position. But isn't it surprising for the Chinese government to suddenly have a change of heart on this issue because this has been going for nearly three years now? Yeah, yeah. No, no, I think, as I said, it's, it's been a while, but I noticed an increase in their concern as the number of Chinese killed or kidnapped increase. So it's, it's normal for any government to be concerned about its citizens and, and that it's because of this, the human trafficking issue, that's because of the, the online gambling. So it's, we take it as an area where we may have different points of view, but we can have cooperation in so far as a crackdown on the legal, the criminal elements involved in this and also in regulating the market so that the phenomenon of human trafficking, I mean, it's similar, our OFW story abroad, it's similar in their case, you know. So that is a legitimate concern. And uh, where we can help, uh, we've been willing to help, you know. It's not a, it's a big issue for us because it has economic impact. And also because we have a different perspective, you know, in terms of the, it's legal in the Philippines. Now, as to the deeper, you know, whether you need to do a review, that, that's a bigger issue for, for the government beyond my competence at this point. <laughs> so with regard to the 6040 agreement, the president's been uh, mentioning that in the past. But do we know now the area of coverage of uh, the possible 6040 sharing, would this be the same service contracts, like maybe 72 or 58? It's a bit early. Uh, I think 57, SC 57, that's not, it's not, a, it's not a problem. Okay. Probably as we go further, as we go further. Uh, so a lot of this will have to uh, go through very intense rounds of negotiations between the experts, you know, from DOE, and or the particular company is concerned. They have to come up with a contract, but the contract has to be in accordance with the Philippine Constitution and also with, uh, with UNCLOS. And, and, and since the Chinese are involved, also in accordance with the Chinese Constitution, I think. So, so there is a, there is a, um, there will be protracted or at least intense negotiations on the legal points and legal experts will have to come in and see how they can phrase it in a way that will be in keeping, that is acceptable to both sides. How many service contracts are involved, sir? No, no, uh, uh, sir, by service contracts we mean those that have been already awarded yeah. and those to be awarded. Uh, how many service contracts are still under the moratorium? <laughs> That's a Secretary Kusi is here, <laughs> yeah, but uh, there are several, <laughs> certainly several. I, I don't have the exact count, uh, but w we have the, the energy minister, the ed energy secretary who's here. Uh, just focusing on the recto bank, that is disputed territory, no? And not what's going we to be? We don't consider it disputed. We Chinese. consider it part of EEC. The Chinese consider it part of their jurisdiction area of jurisdiction. You see, this is where the fundamental difference is. We have our view of the EEC and the Chinese have their view of their area of jurisdiction. And because they don't accept the arbitral award, it's still that view, that there's an overlap. Correct. We don't accept it, but the realities of the ground are such that that's how they view it. 
Uh, so that's what we're trying to work out, and, and that is why the president wants to initiate this discussion, uh, because the West Philippine Sea is involved, as far as we're concerned. Sir, the president said that it looks like the, it looks like the Chinese are okay with the 60-40. Now, if it comes with to the Red Recto Bank, does it mean, sir, that if the Chinese has agreed to a 60-40 sharing, is it a same question to Secretary Penelo yesterday. Uh, is it a tacit acknowledgement or admission that we do have sovereign rights over the area? And that with reference to the orbital ruling, that kinds of affirms are win. <laughs> I'll pass on that. <laughs> that is a that that actually hits on the on the fundamental difference in our point of view. Now, however, they're willing to be flexible. The Chinese expressed their desire to be flexible and pragmatic because of the improving bilateral relations. So what we're trying to do here is to see how far we can go in terms of a friendly approach to China. I mean, there are examples already. Scarborough Shoal, the access to if they took a hard position, since it's under their control right now, they wouldn't allow it. Or, you know, they wouldn't allow it unless we want to insist on it. But there are certain things that are easier to talk about. By not insisting on the differences, by not accentuating the negative, but by accentuating the positive. And this is part of diplomacy. You try to build bridges to bridge the gaps. You don't want to burn bridges and exacerbate the differences. Sorry, with regard to the apologies, yes. the Secretary Loxin tweeted that, uh, <laughs> you know the tweet, so what does he mean by that? He's here. <laughs> <laughs> but when you the ask him. Uh, no, but, but I know what he means. His initial reaction was that he would t take note of it and pass it on to the to the president, and and so it's the president's call. Why did he have to say that he? Well, by implication, is not accepting the apology. No, no, he didn't reject it. Okay. He said he no, took note of it. Okay. Use your microphone. 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 <laughs> Sorry, Ambassador. Uh, who should acknowledge the apology? Is it the fisherman or the Philippine government? The fisherman. The fisherman. Okay, the fisherman. Last question, Mindeng. Yeah, that's what Secretary Loxin said. I'm not a fisherman. So yeah. that's why I'm only noting it. And remember, Secretary Loxin is an appointed official, not an elected official. So he, he represents a department. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, just uh, seeking for clarification. Is the license for the BOGO issued by PACOR or issued by Congress? By? Be by Congress, Congress? or no, by no, PACOR. PACOR. PACOR? So because, as uh, Secretary Panano said, it's up to Congress to ban the BOGO. Uh, I see. So, so, uh, so maybe, we to, <laughs> yeah, maybe we need <laughs> to clarify the details on this. Of that. Yeah. I, that can be resolved domestically. <laughs> yeah, so so the, it don't, don't need to go through Congress if ever the government want to ban Pogo. I, I, I don't want to get into that because I'm, that's not my field of uh, competence. Mm -hmm. uh, ask me about bilateral <laughs> relations and diplomacy and okay. the visit. <laughs> Sorry, I, uh, I think you have to ask that, uh, let's see, who's here? I don't know, maybe when you go back home, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Finance is here, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, MPC and other friends uh, from the media. And uh, from Beijing, China, balik po tayo sa People's Television Network.